Thank you, Lucille. I'm gonna be a pro at this one day. Anyway, welcome all to class. Um, this is, I think, our fifth Indigenous Hemp New Green Revolution class. Am I right? Is this number five? Mm -hmm. So we're like almost halfway through. How are y'all doing out there? You liking it? I mean, I'm having a great time. I'm learning as we go, you know, as everybody knows, and uh, we're trying to do our best, right? And uh, last week, uh, last week we did have our Indigenous Hemp Conference, and then it was followed by our Indigenous Farming Conference here on White Earth. And uh, oh, so many people came from all over, and and we were happy to be able to offer the first day remotely uh, for everybody, and. Uh, but we're all learning as we go. And, um, you know, there's even more to learn. Every time I start turning around, there's something else to learn. And so at this hemp conference, we kind of had a bunch of people that came in mostly from the Northern Plains and then the Diné delegation and then some people from out East came in to share about kind of like where we're at with our indigenous hemp fiber hemp collection. And man, everything from talking about where we're gonna get seeds, that's what we're talking about up here to like how you grow it, who has a tribal hemp policy that works, uh, you know, who's looking at what kind of equipment, um, you know, who's, you know, who's feeling what, super interesting. And, the, and the, a lot of the topics are being discovered and discussed in this class. So I want to say that um, I felt good. Uh, and, you know, some questions on those, if you're interested, and we're thinking of putting together, I was calling it, we we're calling it like a salon. I don't know, like the study group you know, where you could just come and, and hang out and then it'd be like different groups, like you'd have a featured speaker. You know what I'm saying? Like every couple of weeks or maybe once a month, I don't know, like, you know, somebody coming in and talking about decortication and I don't know, Turkey or something, I don't know. You know, we could come up with some ideas. Does that interest people? Yeah, that's what I thought, you know, or, you know, just a different tribe could say, this is what like Flandreau, I was talking to Flandreau tribe out in South Dakota today. And uh, I like them guys cause they're, you know, state of South Dakota is all full of Indian haters. My God, they're always running a competition between them and North Dakota on who could be the ugliest to Indian people. I think South Dakota got it this time, North Dakota a couple of years ago, just back and forth. But anyway, that tribe there, you know, Flandreau, they legalize cannabis and they have a little dispensary and they're also interested in growing hemp, you know? And the state has is, is criminalized it, although it was passed legally by the state referendum. I mean, that's like the crazy thing. Cannabis laws are just crazy across this country, but you know, talking to those people. So we wanna encourage people to grow. And one of the things we were talking about was this hemp growers co-op. Wait, it's called the indigenous farmers co-op. Did y'all hear me? Who's in this class? The indigenous farmers co-op. Now, I just wanna put this out there because you know, now is the time when we're starting to grow seeds and. And I really think that, you know, one of the reasons we're teaching this class is because we want to be sure that, that, uh, that people have access to the information they need to do well with these plants and to be part of the renaissance of the hemp fiber economy, you know, that is coming. That's what the intention of this class is. That's full on the intention, you know? And so uh, figuring out how to, you know, ensure that, that all of that is available to you is, um, you know, part of, part of making sure like in, in these months ahead, if there's stuff that you know, you're know you interested in, follow up with us, but also this co-op is a way, if you're actually farming you know, or interested in it, to be part of it. And uh, we wanna encourage people, we're gonna try to develop some, some papers for this. Um, and we're really focusing kind of on growers in our region, but you know, that could be broadly defined. I mean, I don't just know because you know, I feel like that uh, working together is a good way. And so I just want to put that out there. Anyway, so we're going to do like a little update and provide information. I'm going to do a little mailing and I'll include all you in the mailing that we're going to do as an update from the hemp conference. Does that sound okay? You know, and then uh, then just share with more people. But um, yeah, growing guides and policy guides, that was a little bit of what we were thinking of. But uh, I don't know if, uh, right, see, here's from Blackfeet territory down here, exactly. Exactly what we're talking about, like how are we going to do it unless we just start? And it's you know I'm looking for seeds now, buying seeds here there, and we have some seeds that we have got. We have some Russian seeds. I want to grow them out. You know I think there's a lot of good potential, and so I want to put good hearts and good minds and start this spring. So Blackfeet, 
um, you know, woman, uh, right, Alberta, exactly my sisters and various other cool people to the north and to the and west, you know, uh, you know, this is what we need. Uh, so uh, we could have maybe, we could have, um, you know, what we should do is we should ask Lucille to set up like a virtual hemp seed party kind of like uh what's that called uh when you get pregnant a baby shower. oh uh, a baby shower. Uh, <laughs> yeah no the uh, uh unveiling of the sex that mm -hmm. one where they like yeah gender reveal <laughs> okay okay well like there's gonna be males and females we know that we're not sexing the scenes but yes um, no, cool. You know what I'm saying? So let's have a little virtual one. Maybe we could get assessment on seed, seeds and hopes, you know, and just talk about it. And then, uh, you know, we want to bring in a seed, um, a seed geneticist, and we want to train tribal programs in seed genetics, right? You know, I don't really know. I know, you know, but I know this is very tall, this plant. That's good. You know, this one has a lot of seeds that the birds like. That's a good thing, right? This is perfect for paper making because it's cellulose content is like super. This one's good for electricity. This one makes, you know, uh, hempcrete 100% better. I don't know. Like how are we gonna learn that unless we start working on it and growing it, you know? So that's the intention of this class. And, and I'm hoping that we encourage some farmers out of this bunch. And, and then, you know, we are trying to build this co-op too. And so we also need some, we are hiring some people but we also need some other people to say, hey, we're gonna figure out how to come up with some bucks and do this too, you know? So, cause there's a lot of work to do out there. So I'm just saying, I'm saying, uh, well, what we say around here is put on your big girl panties, you know, or something else that is gender neutral. Anyway, so look at, I'm gonna talk about the materials economy. I'm okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did I get in trouble so far? No. Okay. Whew. I got a younger politically correct person with me. Thank God. Um, I am. Uh, um, okay. This is the story of stuff. Okay. I can get ask Lucille to. Lucille, can you share screen permissions with me? Lucille, can you square, share screen permissions with Kira? She's sitting across the table from me. We are collaborating and we're here at the Ah King Farm complex, you know, kind of like the campus here, right? All right, so long time ago, it's still snow outside, so we could talk about this a long time ago. I'm gonna tell you this story. There's this story that there was these, these uh, monsters, these dinosaurs that lived here in the Northland. And, and uh, you gotta make that smaller for a minute because I have this very epic story to tell. And then we'll share that, okay. <laughs> long time ago, in the Northland, there was uh, these dinosaurs that lived here and they were eating up the villages and eating up everything that was around. And they were laying on the shores of the Great Lakes and sunning themselves and being complete T-Rexes and other such things. And uh, our, our people weren't doing well. And so Nana Buju, that would have been the first Winona son, Nana Buju, he uh, was asking, they were trying to figure out how to kill these guys. And, uh, and uh, because they, they're making a risk of things, you know? And so they went out there and uh, there was different instructions that were given. And none of them work, you know, just, just get the guy super mad and, and then you're squished, right? And then they were told, I can't remember which creature they were told by, they're supposed to shoot the shadow, shoot the shadow of the giants, of the, of the, of the uh, dinosaurs, right? And so he shot the shadow with his really cool arrow and uh, then oil came from that. And that oil came from them in such amounts that all of the animals were dripping in it. And they had to pull the animals out. They had to wipe them off. They had to wipe them off to get the oil off of them. And some animals still have a little oil on them, like the back of a rabbit right in here still has a little oil on them. Bear like me, got a little oil on them. You know, some of the animals still got it, but that's the only way the animals were saved. And so that's supposed to go underground. That was not supposed to come back up because it was a lot of problem the last time it was up. And so it was buried deep underground, okay? So 
that is a little bit the origin of the story from an Anishinaabe perspective of the materials economy. Because it said that, uh, you know, a long time ago, it was talked about these times and these times of this choice between the scorched path and the green path. That is what our ancestors always talked about. And, and you know, my father talked about these times. He talked about the times when there would be no food in the store. That's what he said. And I remember him saying that clearly, that there would be a web in the sky and the change would come then. I feel like that's where we are. Pretty clear, right? All the prophecies said that. So, you know, that's the time we're in. We were given instructions. So in that, we see a time when we are so much into stuff in the materials economy that we are slaves to things. We're just like slaves to stuff. It's like really amazing. I mean, I just witnessed the prostituting of everything in Minnesota for Canadian multinational pipeline company. You know, stuff, oil, fossil fuels. We have like people who have massive security systems to, to protect like giant yachts, boats, all kind of stuff. They're all like all about keeping their stuff, you know, kind of fiefdom like, or, you know, maybe kingdom like, or, you know, oligarchy like, or however you want to call it, right? But that's what's going on. And so I think that one of the things that I want to talk about is this is not about how to keep the same amount of stuff because the stuff's messed up. There's too much stuff and it doesn't fix anything having all that stuff. And so I don't want to be in a position of suggesting at any point that the, that the hemp economy should replace the present materials economy because that would be absolutely idiocy, you know? Because the present materials economy is not only toxic and excessive, it makes us like crazy people. You got security systems and all kinds of investment in security systems. And you got people paying more rent for where they're gonna put their car in New York City than a person could live on, you know? That's like crazy stuff. So we see that the transformation of the materials economy is based on many things. It is based on how we live to start with, you know? It is based on saying, oh, you know, what I think is that we should get a lot more local and not have all kinds of stuff move around, whatever it is, because that adds a lot of stuff to everything, moving things around. You should kind of live within your means. I don't know, you know what that means, but I know ecologically within your means, a little bit challenging, but do you don't understand what I'm saying? Because we got so much stuff in the world that there's more stuff that's humans than the rest of the biosphere. Wait, let me say this one more time. There's more like stuff that is our stuff than uh, the entire biosphere. That's our stuff. We're like our stuff, our cars, our concrete, our walls, our pipelines, our plastic junk in the bottom of the ocean stuff is more than the entire bunch of elephants and trees and rainforests and you know penguins and dolphins and whales in the world. That's how much stuff we have, right? And that's like crazy people stuff, you know? And so we're not about the idea of how you make sure that we got enough stuff. We're about the idea of what do we need, essentially. And when we consider what we need, then we can do the right thing with figuring out how to get the stuff. But really most of the stuff that we need to do, we already extracted enough stuff for that, you know? So given things like copper or, maybe stuff that they're trying to make batteries out of, you know, all that stuff, more of that stuff in landfills than is in these 0.1% deposits in Northern Minnesota full of unobtainium, unobtainium. That's what's there. So they, they don't even imagine that they can't even get, you know? And so my point is, is that we need to enable a, a cyclical economy. That's essential, a cyclical economy, not a linear economy. A linear economy is what we have. It ends in dinosaurs, it begins in dinosaurs and it ends in the air, in carbon, you know? That's a linear economy of burning fossil fuel water, burning fossil fuels, and send it out to the air and pretend like what goes up isn't gonna come down or maybe just pretending like the carbon's supposed to be in the air and not in the land, you know? It's like basic, basic things, you know? But, you know, transforming from, from that level to making sure that things are local, that, that you move to a, a economy which, you know, regenerates instead of is linear. An economy which, you know, reuses everything that is out there. And, and in fact, figures out how to begin uh, remediating, you know, remediating what is. And, and building an economy based on bioremediated lands, you know, instead of concrete, how about some hempcrete from some bioremediated lands, you know? 
let's talk about these things or what is it that we're going to do to make things better. So this is the story about the materials economy, but I had to have that little bit of a preamble on it. So I don't want to be a slave to things. I'm too old to be a slave to anything. Um, so uh, where's um, and my people, all my people fought slavery on both sides. Um, where's our, where's our photos? I have some PowerPoint photos to share with you now on the specifics of the materials economy. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Ta-da! This is Kira, my, my super awesome, and, and usually it's up at the top, but this isn't my PowerPoint. What am I? There we go. There we go. Okay. Look at this. Now I might have to sit next to her. There we go. Can you all still see me and see this hemp in the materials economy? Haven't given you that preamble. You know, okay, let's look at the next slide. It'd be a surprise to me because I've never seen the slideshow before. <laughs> so we can all work together. But I know this material. So this is what we're talking about, right? Okay, so most people are into flour, smoke the flour, squish the flour, I don't know, do whatever because the flour is all the medicine, right? Well, this is not that part. This is the stock. And the stock of these, uh, the stock of these fiber ones looks like this. And so that stuff that is the bass fiber, that's the magic stuff of canvas, carpets, fabric, textiles, right? Y'all following me? The stock itself, that's the stuff you can make paper products out of. You can make all kind of cool stuff like... Uh, Hempcrete out of, oh no, that's more of the stuff, but the herd, the herd is what you got for the hempcrete too. Now the bass fiber, you can also make, uh, uh, they use that in insulation, all right? So one of the questions I have to my brothers and sisters to the states that have legalized cannabis is what are you doing with your stocks? What are you doing, you know? Make some housing for poor people. Make some sustainable housing for people in talent, Oregon. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be my little, you know, burn to the ground, burn to the ground, you know. Anyway, do something right with your stocks. Make something cool. Next picture, please. All right, stuff, man. Okay, so there's this really cool movie called The Story of Stuff, which basically, uh, I don't think we're showing that now, right? Mm -hmm. But this here talks about basically that uh, how it became to be a society that just like. Uh, I think a few years ago, it was like 13 trillion tons of waste, I don't know, that we made. One woman asked me one time, she said, when they say throw it away, where's away? <laughs> That's kind of the question, my friends. There is no away. <laughs> we all live here. Or somebody lives there. And nobody wants our stuff, you know? So we have like this, you know, kind of constipation in the materials economy that is occurring because of the, you know, literal, you know, craziness of these guys and so we're you know we're basically living in this stuff right and that's why we're all getting sick and such things you know this is not a mystery you don't need a phd program in that you know because we all know that that's true and so at every level a lot of this is tied to those same ancient beings that my ancestors talked about you know of the dinosaurs you know because that's what they remember in their stories but anyway so um we got all this stuff and uh, the and uh, the question is is like how to reduce the stuff to start with. So, but what's the next slide here, my friend? Huh? Are you trying to make her go? Oh, okay. Hold on. Story of stuff. Okay. Oh wait. This, so this is what this is one of our problems. I don't know if you ever heard this term here, affluenza. Okay. This is the condition that exists in late fossil fuel state societies where they have so much stuff. <laughs> it's actually a term and that's what people have it's called I, you know, it's kind of first world privilege or fossil fuel privilege and then you get dumber and dumber pretty soon y'all watch the kardashians on tv and then you've reached the apex of your own stupidity you know or maybe we could check on paris hilton and her whereabouts i mean what the hell are we doing so my point is is that i'm just saying this is what happens and it's actually like there's actually a case I don't know that there was a legal case in Texas, of course, where such legal cases are usually litigated from my experience of somebody who got off like a murder charge because he had like affluenza. I was like, okay. So my point is, is that, is that it's a societal illness and the treatment for the illness is not to buy more stuff. The treatment for the illness is start to like wean yourself from stuff and actually do stuff. 
instead of just accumulate stuff. That's kind of, a, a, I don't feel like Dr. Ruth here, but let's go to the next one here. But the addiction levels are so interrelated. But this is, uh, okay, so this is not stuff. This is the cool guy at my house. Oh, it's so nice to have an answer to something here. This is Roman. Okay, now we wanna talk about concrete. All right, so this is the thing about concrete. Concrete represents stuff. Now, first of all, concrete with all the like mining and, and heating and all their crazy stuff that they gotta do to make concrete, right? It turns out that concrete is, uh, okay, Word is that for every person on the planet, we produce about a cubic yard of concrete annually. Now that's some stuff for sure, right? The word is that cement is a source of about 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, according to the think tank Chatham House. Now, if the cement industry was a country, I always like this one, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2 in the world, behind China and the United States. Wait, did you hear that? If the cement industry was a country, it'd be the third largest emitter of CO2 in the world after China and the United States. You don't get a TR for that one. It contributes more CO2 than aviation fuel and is not far behind the global agriculture emission business, right? I mean, it's just like a crazy global agriculture. See, we were already talking about relocalization. All right, so what am I saying? Now, what you wanna do is this hempcrete. What you want to do is use hemp in your in your construction business. Now, this is my friend uh, Roman Viscochel, and he came out here and he's here building. We have this right here down the road in the farm. We have this is our first Ham Creek greenhouse that we made with a guest house. If anybody comes to visit, you could come to the guest house. But in that in that uh, in the uh, in this this building, you can see that it's made of all this this hemp. It's hemp herd, and the thing is, is that because hemp grows really tall, really fast right? When it grows really tall, really fast, it reaches down and takes all that carbon in from the air because that's what plants breathe and it brings it into the plant. And in that it is stored specifically at a very, very efficient and high rate in the sacred hemp plant. Okay. So having said that, when it brings in and you come and you bust up that herd, that herd is then contained in this, which is with lime. That's the other part of this, right? And so this is a carbon sink. And what you need to do is keep getting is, is replace the carbon, the carbon bomb of concrete with the carbon sink of hempcrete, right? Does that make sense? Okay, let's see what we got for next picture on this. Do we have some smart graph or something? No. No lag. Okay. Here with plastics. Okay. This is a very bad situation. You know, and every time I hear about, you know, half the time when people are now trying to involve me in their project where they're getting making clothing out of ocean plastics you know yeah somebody get it together you know and who made all that stuff right i mean this is a giant mess and you know the fact is is that there was no plastic you know i'm 62 years old and when i was a, a kid i remember them talking about petroleum byproducts that's what they full-on call this stuff petroleum byproducts right they didn't call it plastic it had a name petroleum byproducts that's who made all this stuff right and so it said that, uh, you know, 100 years ago, we had a choice between a, a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. That's what it said we had. It's a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. And the fact is, is that we made the wrong choice, you know, and that's what this looks like, because this is, this is the, the fossil fuels economy fueled by the wartime economy that, of course, made the industry economy that we now have upon our necks and in our ocean. You know, I was looking at this, uh, oh, let me find it here in my notes, my um, Henry Ford and his little car he had made. Okay, check this out. Replacing plastics. Oh my God. I love that guy. I hate that guy, but I love that guy. I guess, I don't know. Okay. When Henry Ford recently unveiled this plastic car, Okay, do, did I mention who unveiled the plastic car? Henry Ford, right? He's like a super old cat, like 1915 or something. I don't know, when was Henry Ford around? Does anybody remember, you understand what I'm saying? Like this wasn't uh, Elon Musk. This was Henry Ford, like 1915 or something or 1920. All right, get this. When Henry Ford recently unveiled a plastic car result of 12 years of research, he gave the world a glimpse of the automobile of tomorrow. 
Its tough panels molded under hydraulic pressure of 1,500 pounds per square inch PSI from a recipe that calls for 70% of the cellulose fibers from wheat straw, hemp, and sisal. Wheat straw, hemp, and sisal, plus 30% resin binder. The only steel in the car is its tubular welded frame. The only steel in the car is its tubular welded frame. The plastic car weighs a ton, a thousand pounds lighter than the steel car, and that means less fuel. All right? So of course, this was the idea that should have happened. This is the, the you know, essentials of the plastic economy. You know, but what I wanna say is that it's not our intention. Like this is what should have happened is that we should have been making things that we would make now out of plastic, out of hemp for all these years. But we shouldn't make everything. I mean, cause I think that we all wanna be super honest, you know, is, uh, you know, here's like stuff that's never gonna decompose, right? Plastic bottles, look at them, right? They're like the scourge of the earth from what I can figure. And I see them at all these tribal gatherings all the time. I just wanna get sick about it. You know, what should you do? You should have people have cups and you should have local water or bring in some water for people to drink. Don't have them, don't give up plastic bottles. It's a crime, you know? But wait a second, back up, jeepers. Anyway. So my assistant over here, but um, my point is, is that maybe we don't want to make everything. What you need to do is relocalize your economy so that not everybody is driving around trying to figure out where to pick up their plastic straw, you know, because at some point you don't really need a plastic straw for everything. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be like super mean or anything, but, you know, I always tell my kids because I'm a mean mom and a mean grandma. You know, you can get a straw if your jaw is wired closed. Otherwise, just use your mouth. You know, I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, what, where do these ideas come from that we need these things? You know, we don't need all this stuff. This is part of the problem. And so we don't want to replicate everything that exists, you know, with, a, with something of hemp. So not every plastic bottle, not everything needs to be had. You know, and some things like I had a conversation with the tribe yesterday with some folks and we were talking about, they were talking about making hemp, hemp uh, um, uh, utensils, you know, to replace the utensils that are used by uh, people for, um, um, you know, at picnics and stuff. I think that's a good idea, but I was like, why don't you just use wood? We have a lot of wood right here. You know, maybe the hemp needs to be a car or something. You know what I'm saying? It's not everything should be hemp. I'm not trying to be, I'm just trying to say, let us be coherent and thoughtful in the process to not just say, I'm gonna replace everything in the materials economy with hemp when some stuff should just not be replaced. Okay, enough said, sorry about that. Had to go on that one for a while. Um, next picture. Okay, now these guys, I just went and met with these guys and spent a lot of time with them. Okay, the ultra capacitors. And basically, so if you could take, uh, we had this in the class last week or a couple weeks ago. Did you guys all see him? Or maybe he was just no, at the, at the huh? He was just at the conference. So he's coming to class, but just think of it this way. So one, we got to make things like out of hemp instead of concrete and including maybe out of cars, you know, up to cars and a lot of car parts and such things, right? But then we need to power things, not with fossil fuels, but really with other kinds of energy, or really we just need to not really truck around so much. You know, our food doesn't need to move so far. Things just don't need to move so far. It's okay to not be like a global person all the time because globalization is really vastly overrated when you're trying to survive in the middle of planetary crisis. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, <laughs> the news out, 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 update, you know, I think I'll wait for my Colombian followers today. I'll just grow some myself. That's basically what I'm saying. Grow stuff yourself, you know, get more local. Don't be just trying to figure out how to jet yourself around the world, you know, to get your cool, with your cool hemp, you know, your hemp battery plane, just stay home, you know? Uh, but then, you know, I know that things like the grid takes power, these, this, this internet takes power, you know? And so you need those things. And for this, you, these guys are at a good start. I went and met with these guys out and you're gonna come meet them in class in a couple of weeks out there in, in uh, Massachusetts and they have like a lab and they're, they're, they're taking a battery and doubling the lifespan of it, you know, or, or making it by 20 times higher lifespan. You know, and anything that you can do to keep, increase the efficiency of the materials and energy economy 
is critical as we look at transitioning from a fossil fuels economy to an electrical economy, right? And say that instead of making all this stuff in a hemp economy, in, in electrical economy, like maybe batteries that Tesla needs to do all the fabulous things that he's gonna do, instead of making them out of nickel from Northern Minnesota mines or some unobtainium from you know, indigenous people's Paiute territory in Nevada, you know, maybe they could just be made out of hemp, right? That's what we need. And there's in, in the magical power of the cellulose and the carbon sequestration of hemp batteries, it's hemp itself, it is able to, in, in its form as a biochar, have a huge amount of graphene in it that makes it a, a conductor of power, a conductor of electricity, you know? So what I'm saying, you'll have more on that class. We had some already, but there, that's the next step in the materials economy. And then this is a little bit what we're heading in on is, uh, is uh, timber and papers. You know, I'm living up here in Northern Minnesota and I've seen the stupidest decisions by the government of Minnesota as I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've lived a long time, just unbelievable. So, they want to build like a 120 football field size facility that's 10 stories high to process oriented strand board in northern Minnesota in the middle of the Chippewa National Forest and next to the Leech Lake Reservation. That's essentially going to assault the remaining biodiversity of the North Forest. That's a really bad idea. And we're going to fight them. Leech Lake is against them. All the Ojibwe's are against them. It's just a bad idea. The solution is something like hemp wood. Thank you. Let's just do that. You know, hemp wood, these cats have got all kind of cool stuff and look at that. Oh my God, hemp wood and hemp insulation. This is the, the bomb, this is the bomb stuff, man, right? And where's checkout planted here? This is Eli saying something here too. She's gonna talk about the paper economy, but this is really like, why would you put up an oriented strand board plant when you could have an entire carbon protection world, you know, that brings in the carbon in the north and leaves the biodiversity of the forest intact, and instead you make hemp wool, hemp wood, and then wool insulation, you know. So we'll talk more about these things some, but this is hemp protection and this is hemp wood. The wool insulation is by hemp protection, but that is what I mean. The materials economy is certainly at every level uh, would be served better by a hemp than it is by the present configuration of poor choices. Uh, last uh, pictures, are we almost out? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and here's some paper, which is pretty much a segue into our speaker. And uh, I might just take a little break before I bring her up, but uh, this is uh, our Diné people were at our conference this weekend, and, and this is some, Dene made a uh, uh, hemp wool paper. And this is part of the work uh, that's gonna be ahead in the, in the Hemp Growers Cooperative. Artisan paper boxes of hemp and wool. I'm in, you know, make less stuff, make quality stuff, reuse stuff, you know, be kind with your stuff. Feeling kind of Buddhist. No, just laughing. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That's kind of a little opening of, of the potential for the hemp economy. And, uh, you know, I'm just saying that it is open. It is the fields are open and the seeds need to be planted. And uh, we're glad we have this little class here. So I think I'll, I'll uh, take a little break, look in the chat a little bit, and then uh, I'll bring it back to Ellie. Yes, does that sound okay? Alyssa.
a friend of mine was cleaning out her mother's old house and this was she found and it was like oh my gosh right this is it and then they was like oh let's you know we can't have this going out with golf they got to think this is not anyway this is astounding our history how stupid we are <laughs> that is so true i think that it's like i think i feel like we need to do like a little uh like even a little education about this stuff you know i mean we all know it but kind of in the context of why him became such a bad guy, you know? That's cool. A seed shower. That's so great. I love it. Very fun. Okay, Karen is in the far north, huh? Hi, everybody. Do you want me to talk now or? No. Oh, no. <laughs> I think that'd be great if you guys are all ready. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm ready to drink a little coffee and listen. All right, sounds good. And thank you, Anona, for having me here. It's truly an honor to participate. And I'm wearing the shirt you gave me, represent Sake Water's <laughs> Life. Um, and I actually happen to have some hemp wood. Uh, yeah, this is some hemp wood. Uh, they're in Kentucky. And I mentioned planted, which they're doing oriented strand board out of hemp. But I actually have a former colleague that met with them. And they're apparently moving towards other, um, other materials, but all plant-based, non-timber. Non and then... I was actually doing some experimenting. Um, was my, I have a puppy and she chews like crazy. So I got some uh, resin to try to do a chew toy, but I don't want to use toxic things. So this is actually a blend of hemp fiber and I melted down pine resin to use instead of um, like epoxy. And it's black because I added charcoal powder because it, I don't know, it helps it be like a little less sticky. So, you know, it's just like so many possibilities, right? And I put some like peanut butter protein powder, but you know, it's just so many different things we can do with the stocks. Um, these are some samples of handmade hemp paper that I've made. Uh, so I guess a little bit about my experience and background is I started making hemp paper in 2012. I was um, making um, greeting cards with my nature photography. I, I realized that like some of the best healing you can get is from like being out in nature and connecting with plants and beauty and just, you know, experiencing nature. And so I was taking a bunch of photos and then I started making greeting cards and selling them and I was looking for hemp paper. Um, and there's a book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which hopefully it's been mentioned in the class, but if you haven't heard about it, it's basically like the hemp Bible. Uh, it talks about all the different uses of hemp. It talks about why hemp was outlawed. So I would definitely recommend getting a copy. I think it's available to read online for free, actually. Um, so that's where I first learned about hemp as a paper making material. Um, so yeah, I had been wanting to find a, a hemp paper to print my artwork on. And the only hemp paper available in the market was a 25% hemp, 75% uh, recycled blend called Hemp Heritage which is distributed by a company called Greenfield 
paper. Um, and, and their paper is awesome, but I'm a little stubborn and like as an artist, I really wanted something 100% hemp because it's really strong. It's archival, so it'll last a long time. So that's like why I started on this journey, because I asked Greenfield if they could make 100% hemp paper and they told me no. And then I just woke up one day and I was like, well, you know, how do you do it? Like, I, so I think, you know, it's important to just try new things and just learn. So, and I wish I could have been at the conference, um, but I have a PowerPoint that basically goes over just the whole paper making process. Um, I do have some videos on YouTube, which I am um, trying to make some more. This is my brand Artisan Hemp, that's the logo. So yeah, I guess let me share my screen here. And then if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we can go over at the end. Let's see. Okay. Oh, all right. So, sorry. Uh, play from start. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Okay. So paper one. So first, what is paper, right? Um, you know, before paper was invented, people used things like stone tablets and clay. Um, you know, to, to document things. A lot of people think papyrus is paper, but it's actually not. Papyrus is actually like the strands of a, of a plant and then they're kind of woven together and then a glue is applied so it makes it stick together. But true paper is, uh, there's thin sheets made from uh, fiber that's been macerated basically until the cellulose is, is broken and freed and then it's um, bonded back together. So it's, you're basically, you're creating a pulp, um, adding it to water and then um, screening the water out and then the fibers um, hold, they bond back together. Um, so before, uh, so the, actually the first paper made back in China long time ago was made out of a blend of um, hemp fishing nets because uh, hemp was used for um, fabrics. It was used for netting, for fishing, ropes, things like that. So it was um, hemp fishing nets combined with mulberry bark. So um, that's, you know, that's like the technical definition. So you know, you just want to like, get, it's all about the pulp and we'll, I'll go into that more. And then on the bottom here are some uh, images of handmade hemp paper that I've made. And you can see on the left, there's a, a variety of different tones and textures that you can get and it's all 100% hemp. And then the other sheet on the right, it has some backlight so you can see like those little darker specks are pieces of herd. Um, so let's, uh, talk a little about why we want to use, uh, hemp, you know, versus trees, uh, you know, besides the obvious, but, um, so, you know, hemp contains, uh, a lot more cellulose. So 75% to 85% of cellulose, that's the usable part of the plant that we want for paper. Wood contains 30% to 50%. You know, so it's more efficient. Um, according to U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, bulletin published in 1916, one acre of hemp could produce the same amount of paper that four acres of trees could over a 20-year period. So that's that's crazy, right? Hemp can be harvested 20 times over that 20-year period, so once a year, and trees are are harvested once. So, um, you know, the U.S. government was doing research on hemp since the early 1900s. They had uh, this actually, this bulletin was published by a USDA botanist named Leister Dewey. And he, uh, he had a, a research farm on the site of, of what the 
what's the Pentagon where the Pentagon stands today. And he actually grew hemp there. Um, and actually his diaries were discovered by a friend of mine. Uh, and they were put online. So if you Google like Leicester Dewey hemp diaries, um, sorry, it's actually online and they, um, they hired somebody, uh, Vote Hemp hired somebody to go through these diaries and pick out all the parts where he mentioned hemp. So he did a lot of amazing research and that was in the early 1900s. But he also, he published a paper also in 1916, which was titled Hemp Herds as a Papermaking Material, which that's available online as well. So basically the high cellulose content of hemp means that fewer chemicals and less energy is needed to process it into a pulp. Um, also, it doesn't require like uh, carcinogenic dioxin bleaches, which I mean, carcinogen, that is, means that it causes cancer. So when they process timber for paper, because it has so is less cellulose, it means it has more of the lignin, which that's what needs to be removed. So they, it just requires more, uh, more stronger, harsher chemicals. Uh, so why is hemp not being used for paper? Well, existing machinery for pulping is not suitable for annual bast fiber plants. Uh, the, the pulpers that are used in the industrial paper industry were developed for timber, which are the short fibers. So it's just a different, different machinery. So basically it comes down to nobody invested in something that is better for, you know, for people and for the planet you know, it's not that it can't be done. It's just that we need innovation and we need uh, investment in creating new machinery for that purpose. Um, you know, so the, uh, I mentioned rags, rag paper before. So like a lot of the uh, clothing was made out of hemp. And so rags were actually the main uh, paper making material. But actually, after the invention of the automatic printing press, there was a much higher demand for paper. Uh, and the paper makers actually ran out of rags. So they needed something new, a new fiber source. And timber, you know, they looked around, what's cheap, what's abundant? Well, you know, trees. So, and then no, there's also a lot of theories about, um, you know, competing industries, and I'm not going to get into all of that. Um, but it, it is mentioned in the Emperor Wears No Clothes book with like the, um, uh, yeah, all, like newspaper conglomerates and timber industry. Um, so, um, so some of the environmental benefits of growing hemp for paper, uh, it enriches depleted soil, adds nitrogen, um, the deep roots protect soil from runoff, um, phytoremediation means that it detoxifies, it basically cleans the soil. It soaks up chemicals and other toxins, um, heavy metals, radiation. Um, there were some studies, I think it was in either West Virginia, uh, where they actually planted hemp near coal mines and also um, Chernobyl uh, to test the uh, phytoremediation properties. Um, sunflowers are another crop that has phytoremediation qualities. Um, it absorbs CO2 and potential to end logging and destruction of forests. You know, uh, the number one nutrient we need for life, right? Oxygen for human life, um, the lungs of the planet. So we really need to stop cutting down trees for paper. Um, and so I mentioned lignin before, you're probably like wondering what the heck is lignin. Um, it's the glue that binds the cellulose together. Um, so it provides protection for the plant against um, like major climate uh, pathogens, pests. It's like a gluey resinous 
substance. Um, it helps the plant to bend, you know, if there's like a tornado or it's very windy and so it won't break, it'll bend. Um, it has a brownish color. And, um, you know, some people are proposing GMO trees with lower lignin content. Um, I'm anti-GMO, you know, we don't know the safety for the long term. And then, you know, if we're removing the plants, you know, mechanism of defense that will probably introduce more uh, diseases, which is not good. Um, so hemp has lower lignin content. So it has more cellulose, lower lignin, um, doesn't require such toxic chemicals. And, uh, and there's actually uses for lignin. So um, binder for particle board and uh, composite products, soil conditioner, um, epoxy and adhesive. Uh, some of the benefits of hemp paper, um, it's reusability, so it can be recycled. Um, I think it's like seven to eight more times than wood paper because it is so strong. So it, it holds its shape, um, very durable, mold resistant, resistant to UV light. It's archival, which means that it, it's acid free. So it doesn't yellow or um, it resists decomposition. So if you've seen like really old paper, sometimes it'll turn yellow and get all frayed at the edges, like especially newspaper, because they they don't uh, they don't produce it to be archival. You know, it's meant to be you know thrown away. Um, but like for important documents or like artists, they they require um, archival paper, so it needs to be processed in a way that all of the acids are are removed. Um, some of the market applications, um, so fine art paper and cardstock print and copy paper, uh, books, magazines, although as Winona was mentioning, like, you know, we, we need to reduce our, our consumption and our wants. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff, if we can not use paper, then it's better to not use paper. Obviously toilet paper is probably not going away, although you should probably, we should like get more bidets. Um, but yeah, so that's a big one. Um, hasn't really been done yet. There was a company for a while saying that they were doing it, but I've never actually seen it. Um, there was a guy walking around um, NOCO Hemp Expo a few years ago, or probably like five years ago with a off-white uh, colored roll of toilet paper and it was actually like wheat straw or something, um, you know, but it's the idea that's like in everybody's minds, right? Like we can be wiping our ass. We could be cleaning our asses while cleaning the planet. Um, you know, paper towels, uh, boxes, shipping products, smoking papers, packaging, money, although, you know, money, paper money is kind of going away. Uh, you know, coffee filters. I mean, but even that, you know, you can get a metal filter. So, but, you know, there's still definitely needs. And then with the packaging, I just want to note too, that something I'm seeing is that um, some companies are coming out with paper bottles. Like I saw something with Coca-Cola, they were developing a, a paper bottle that had a, like a waterproof lining on the inside. So that that's really cool. So um, when we're talking about hemp fiber for paper, uh, there's two main types of fiber in the in the hemp stalk. So we have the outer bast fiber, which are the long, strong fibers that are used for uh, textiles. Um, and then the inner woody core, which is also called herd or shiv. Um, that's what is used for hempcrete, also great for animal bedding or even mulching for gardens. Um, so they can both be used for paper. Actually, um, back in 2013 or 14, I um, attempted to do just hemp herd paper after I heard about the Leicester Dewey paper or you know report. 
about using hemp herds uh, as a paper making material. And it didn't actually work. Herd by themselves, they didn't like, they didn't bind enough. And when I went to try to fold it, which is a good test for paper to see how strong it is, it basically just broke apart. So it does need to be added to something else. And like my work has mostly been 100% hemp paper. So I'll add it to fiber in different ratios, just depending on like what the end product I'm looking to, to make is. So, you know, if I want something really strong, I'll do just best fiber or as, as little herd as possible. Cause the herd is, um, it's decreasing the strength, but it's, it does help with, um, the formation and it kind of helps to smooth out the paper. And it also tends, I've noticed it decreases the drainage time. So that's something with paper, like it depends on like how long the fibers have been beaten, but when you have too long of a drainage time, it's not good, uh, especially when you're going to the large uh, industrial paper machines. They have very specific spe uh, specifications to like how, what the drainage time is. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of research we still need to do with that. Uh, this is just I don't know, a little video of like a hemp farm. In Kentucky in 2017, you can see there's a bunch of males out there and females. The males are the uh, lighter colored um, ones there. And they're not as tall. Those are the pollen sacs. Um, so, you know, after, uh, so you have a field, right? And then you harvest. Um, some people do it by hand. You can use a tractor. There's a lot of different ways to harvest. Um, but redding would be the next step after harvest. Uh, so you just think of the word rotting. Uh, it basically means to, uh, it's helping to break down the lignin and it, it helps to separate the bast fibers from the herd. Uh, and on the bottom here, there's some photos, or this is a photo of, um, forget, I think it's called like a, a, is it a shackle or that's how they used to dry the- Shock, it's a shock. Shock, yes, thank you. Um, there, and there's old photos from like back, you know, before um, prohibition showing images of like a bunch of these shocks and hemp fields. So that was one way to uh, field red, um, but oftentimes farmers will lay the, the stalks down on the ground and do red uh, for about two weeks. It, it depends on the weather and humidity and different things. And you wanna turn it over about halfway, uh, but you, you really have to keep an eye on it because I have spoken with a farmer who redded it too much and then you lose some of the strength and then it can also result in mold and mildew. So that's really something you need to watch out for. Like. I've seen some hemp stalks that have been stored improperly and turned a dark grayish, even blackish color. And that can be really um, dangerous to handle because it has um, mold. So water redding is another method. Um, you can uh, submerge them in water, preferably a running source, like a creek. So like back in, like in countries where they never stopped uh, growing hemp, like like in Asia, especially um, China. They a lot of times they will they'll red it in a creek and they'll they'll kind of um, portion off a part of the creek and then put a weight on the stalks so that it won't you know just get um, it won't just flow away. But the great thing about water redding is it's a natural and non toxic way to lighten the fibers. And then in some parts of the world, hemp is actually left in the fields over the winter on the snow. And this is a, another great way to naturally lighten the hemp fibers. Um, and then another method of redding, which is quicker, is steam redding. Uh, so it's basically like 
steaming asparagus, you know, you're, you're putting it in a, you know, a pot with um, a little water in the bottom and bringing it to boil and then simmering it. And um, I've done it a few times. It smells great too. So it, it's really interesting when you do that, the, the, the uh, outer bass fiber after you've, after they've cooked for um, you know, about two hours, that bass fiber will slide right off. And then it's cool because if you're um, doing that with whole stocks, you can actually have like a whole piece of herd. So it if it hasn't been run through a decorticator, like this background of broken herd, um, you can actually have like whole pieces. And because the inner portion of the stock is hollow, I've actually wondered if it'd be, if you could put like colored wax in there and make crayons or something like that would be a cool experiment. I, I sorry, I don't have a photo of, of that, of those herds without the bast fiber, but it's pretty cool. I recommend you trying that. Oh, these are some photos of um, some steam reading. So on the left, that was actually when I was out at Pine Ridge Reservation in 2017 for the hemp days in June, actually where I first met Winona. Um, we harvested some wild hemp that was growing outside of Alex's house. Um, so that was the first time I actually was able to steam and work with fresh, freshly harvested hemp. Um, and it worked really well. And then I do, I do have a video actually on YouTube that shows a little of the pulping um, when we were out there. And then on the right is um, after the stalks were steamed, this is the bast fiber, excuse me, after it was peeled from the stalk. And this is marijuana grown in DC. So, you know, it's not limited to industrial hemp. You can use any kind of cannabis, you know, it is more labor intensive, but when you do that, it, it does make beautiful paper. When you're able to get rid of all the, the herd, it just makes some of the most beautiful paper I've ever made. Um, so, you know, if you're not um, hand peeling the, the stalks, you would want to decorticate, which basically means you're uh, separating the bast fiber from the herd. And like I mentioned earlier, you can use either just the bass fiber or both in different ratios. And on the bottom left here, we have a, a hemp break. You're basically just hitting, hitting the whole stalks. And as you do that, the herd gets broken down and it, and it just falls off the bass fiber. Um, this is, these are hackles. It's like a comb. So you're just kind of refining the the long bass fibers a little bit you don't really need that for paper making uh it's better, more for like if you're going to be spinning for textiles and then here's um this here on the left are some whole stalks and then on the right both of these are decorticated fiber the this stuff is a little cleaner um here you can see some bits of of herd are still in there this is all in Kentucky. Um, yeah, and then the, I just love this photo. Like when I was um, working on uh, separating the, uh, peeling the bast off the, the uh, stalks, there were some little kids that came up. This is like early morning and it was great because, you know, they were interested in what I was doing and I asked if they wanted to help and they did. And they, you know, it's like a great activity for everybody. Uh, and then the dogs, of course, they're great. Uh, and this is the, these are the plants that were growing outside of Alex's house. So after you have your, uh, your fiber ready, and I did also, um, let me go back because these long fibers, you can put that directly in, uh, in a pot to cook, but I actually prefer to cut it first into one inch pieces. Um, 
so basically, you know, if you cut it first, you're, you're spending time and labor, but you are preventing um, potential like issues later on. So I did find it best to just cut it up um, first because it helps it to cook more evenly. So, but the next step would be to cook the fibers and that's uh, delignification. So you're basically, you're removing the lignin. So like we, we talked about earlier, you want to get rid of the lignin. So you're freeing up the bonds of the hemp fiber. So when you do that, you get rid of the lignin and then you have just the, the cellulose um, and the cellulose will bond to itself much better. So when you do cook it, you end up with much, with stronger paper. You don't necessarily have to cook it, but your paper won't be as strong. So maybe if you're doing like uh, take out containers or, or like molded products or even the, um, you know, or even any paper that's not meant to be, you know, held on to, right. Um, you could even add some seeds to plant it, right. Wildflower pollinator seeds in that paper. Um, but you know, um, so it is an important step. It's best to be done outside or if you don't have outdoor space you can do it inside just make sure you have good ventilation um yeah it's not super toxic but it's not great to inhale i kind of like the smell but you know i try to oh, do it outside anyway um so you know you just want to cook them i use soda ash which is what's also used as a ph balancer for swimming pools so if you go to like a store that sells a bunch of random stuff you could probably find it in the department that sells that kind of thing it's also sold in um art stores in the department for um uh tie-dyeing it's it's uh used in that process but lye is another it's lye is much stronger um i tried that one time and i burned myself and you do not want to get <laughs> A chemical burn from lye it's like that movie um fight club like it's bad so if you do use lye make sure to wear gloves and safety goggles and you can actually make lye out of wood ash there is a method of doing that so you actually don't really need to buy anything so let's see yeah so you know Pretty cool. You can make it out of wood ash, cook the fibers for about two to four hours. I use about a 25% ratio. A lot of times I just eye it out depending on how much fiber I have. Or, you know, if I'm being good, I'll weigh the fiber and then I'll calculate what 25% is and weigh the soda ash too. Um, you do want to rinse it well, but during that process, the cooking water will turn from, you know, clear to a dark brown. And I have actually wondered if that cooking water could be like boiled down and used for some kind of ink or paint. I haven't done that yet, which I should, but maybe one of you will do it. I mean, that would be really awesome, right? Make paper and then use that lignin for some ink and make some art or, you know, um, print something with that ink, lignin ink. This is a photo of the uh, fibers from Alex's at, at um, Pine Ridge. That was just as I, before it started cooking. So you could see the water is still clear. Uh, another thing is you can um, bleach the fibers uh, use, using hydrogen peroxide. So, you know, pretty um, big, big difference here. So if you are looking to do, you know, some kind of paper that does need more brightness or, you know, lighter color, you can use hydrogen peroxide for that. It, you know, if you're not able to use uh, water redding or something like that. Um, so pulping, um, you know, that's when we're macerating the fibers. There are different methods to doing that. So the machine, that is most commonly used is called a Hollander beater. And 
This is Das here. He's an, an OG in the hemp world. He brought a Hollander beater up to Pine Ridge and we made some pulp there. Um, you can beat it by hand, although it, it does take a long time. I've tried it, um, but you know, you can work on your, your rhythm and it's a nice meditation. Uh, just get a meat mallet or a two by four. Like you don't need to buy anything. You probably have something laying around you can use. Uh, using the freshly harvested hemp is going to be easier because they're just more tender uh, and easier to break down. Uh, there's a little video. So that just shows that's my little portable Hollander beater. It's a lot slower than like the bigger, more um, industrial ones or like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> These are images from beating the fibers by hand. And uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's a great option. If you, uh, if you have some hemp and you just want to make some paper and not uh, buy a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is a diagram of a Hollander beater. So basically there's a tub that's like an oval shape. And then there's what's called, um, um, well, there's like a cylinder with a bunch of sharp kind of edges. Uh, let me get a better picture. There, that's, uh, that's the one I learned on. It's a Reina five pound beater. They come in different sizes. You can get like a two pound, bigger one, 50 pound. Uh, but that, that, uh, that'll break it down. That thing's a beast. Um, this is my portable one. Just some photos. It's named a manual after Dr. Bronner because it was donated by um, David Bronner, who was a big supporter of my work of Dr. Bronner's magic soaps. They're huge um, pioneers in the hemp world. Uh, these are some images of the different stages of pulping. So on the left, you can see it's not really that broken down. You can still see the longer fibers. And then on the right, it's more, looks more like pulp. Like it's basically ready to make some sheets. Uh, sheet forming. So, um, you're basically submerging a mold and decal, which is the main tool, uh, into the vat of slurry. You're lifting it up you're, and you're draining the water out. And then um, once that water is drained out, it's just cellulose fibers and, and they stick together. Um, these are some images of the sheet forming also from Pine Ridge. Um, and it's a great activity, you know, Children love it. Everyone seems to love like making things with their hands. It's empowering, right? If you make your own things and stop like just buying stuff all the time. So here he has uh, submerged. So on the bottom here, this is the mold and decal. It's basically like a wooden frame or you can even use metal uh, one frame. And then a second frame that has a screen attached to it. So that top part is making the shape and the bottom has the screen for the water to drain out of. So here he's submerging it and then he has it lifted up and waiting for the water to drain out. And this is what the vat looks like. And inside is called the slurry, which is basically the term for pulp mixed with water. So like a thinned out pulp. Uh, this is just a quick video, like I'll sh showing you the process. So this is a 12 by 18 sheet, just submerging it in the water. And then you want to move it around and just uh, pick out like any clumps or anything and clean off the edges. It's nice to do that. And uh, just shake out some of the water and then lay it to let it finish uh, draining. And then the next step, well, after that, you're gonna um, transfer it onto another surface. You wanna get it off the mold uh, and decal or unless you're 
planning on drying it on the mold, which I'll talk about in the drying section. Um, but pressing it is important because it does help reduce drying time and it really makes the paper stronger. This is an image of a hydraulic press. I've made like a really simple one using a two ton um, bottle jack press. You can find it in an auto parts store. So, you know, you don't need to get a $15,000 press or you can use your body weight. Like when I didn't even have my bottle jack, I would just stand on the boards, like have some wooden boards on top and then just stand on it and do a little dance. And it really does get a lot of water out. Um, so a few different ways to dry, restraint drying, where you are, um, the sheets of paper are just layered between uh, felt, blotter papers, cardboard, you have a fan on one side and then weights on top. And then board drying, basically you're putting the, transferring the sheets of paper onto a board. This can be glass, wood, metal. Um, a lot of times when I do workshops, I bring pieces of uh, plexiglass that works really well, uh, but windows are great. And actually when I was at Winona's, place in the fall I made some paper and I let it dry on the windows um, and it could also be hung uh, if you have if you transfer it onto a towel or something you can hang that on a clothesline although hemp does tend to shrink when it dries um, but it really depends on your temperature and humidity so like it's pretty wild like less like if it dries too quickly if it's very dry climate, it's going to like wrinkle a lot more. So, you know, a lot of trial and error. Uh, some places actually dry it directly on the molds, which is common in Asia where they'll have like a bunch of molds and then they'll lay it out in the sun and it'll dry right on the screen. Um, so when you're able to put it in the sun, it does make it dry more quickly and then also reduces that wrinkling effect because it kind of gets a little stuck to the screen. This is what I mean by the restraint drying where you have by or trywall cardboard. It's good to have those little gaps of air for the airflow and then the blotter paper. Um, and then or and then I also use felt. And then these are the sheets of paper. So you just stack them and then uh, put some weights. You can put bricks or any, you know, anything heavy. And then it's good to cover it up. So that, um, this is from a book called Paper Making with Plants. And then she recommends um, Helen, her name is Helen Hybert, I think. She recommends putting a sheet of plastic or anything over just to keep that airflow contained. Uh, so, and then these are images of board drying and you can see the different shapes. This was at a workshop in North Carolina where people made their own sheets of paper and they put different plants and flowers and things that they found in the paper, which is another thing you can do. Uh, the paper will take on the, uh, like the surface that it's on. So like if you're putting it on a really smooth surface like plexiglass, the the side of the paper that's on the plexiglass is gonna end up being like really smooth, which can be really fun to experiment with different textures and shapes. And then like different specialty papers, uh, like I've had a lot of fun making uh, these papers that have actual fresh cannabis leaves, basically sandwiched in between two sheets of paper uh, this was also at um, Pine Ridge. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, you can put seeds in the paper. So, you know, that's a really great thing, especially for like packaging, instead of throwing the paper in the garbage or into like the recycling bin, you can put pollinator seeds in there and plant it. Um, you can put other things like I've experimented with natural mineral pigments, gold leaf leaves, you know, a lot of different things. Uh, and then this is an image of a forge rainier machine, which is the automatic 
paper making machines. So that was like the first one. So it's the same process. So you can see on the left is the vat of pulp and then it's being drained onto a, a moving screen. And so here as the water drains, it goes through presses. They're called calendars, these metal rollers. So it's pressing the sheets and then it goes through the heated metal rollers, which are drying it. So it's the same process, you know, it's just automated in a production machine. And that's me in front of a, a paper machine because I've been like on this journey to try to make 100% hemp paper. So I um, partnered with the university pilot mill and went up and we did a pilot run and it just totally didn't work because they um, used the wrong pulper, but that's a story for another time. Uh, so, but you know, there's, it, it can be done. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm confident we can do it. Um, these are some of the paper samples from uh, working with that group. They, uh, they did a lot of different weights and like I, I had to test it out. I was doing some R and D for smoking paper. It actually worked really nicely. Um, smooth, nice white ash. So yeah, I guess um, that's it. Uh, many possibilities. Let's stop cutting down trees for paper. And um, let me know uh, if there's any questions. I haven't looked. So I'll look at that now. Let's see. I just want to say thank you for that presentation. That was really, really informational. I learned all kinds of things. And I think you should come up and visit because they want to cut down a bunch of trees and we should just grow some hemp and make some paper, obviously. Yeah, we you know? need to talk more, definitely. I can bring um, my pulper. Yeah. Well, it will, the, the spring is coming. More people visit us when it is spring <laughs> than in the in the depths of winter. No, okay. I'm just... And my puppy is calming down a little too. <laughs> right, right. No, it is all good. But wow, what a, what a tremendously interesting presentation. And I wanted to add that we had had a couple of thoughts. So I just wanted to say, so for Anishinaabe people, our paper is really historically birch bark. And so we weren't papyrus people, but a lot of birch bark, a lot of writing on birch bark. And so, you know, just to say we did have some different kinds of paper in different places, but different different ways of writing. And then uh, I was really thinking that, uh, you know, in this uh, moment, we had, we had had some Diné people and they had used wool fiber. And uh, that seemed to work really well. And I'd like to see an exploration more of that, you know, because it seemed like uh, that uh, we had showed a picture of that earlier. And uh, they really had an excellent wool fiber uh, with uh, just the discarded pieces, you know, also the kind of thing you can use for a filament. But I just want to say that. But thank you so much for the presentation. That was like so super interesting. And I'm sure a bunch of people have questions, um, but very, very explicit. Thank you so much. I'm going to, I'm going to sign off so you don't see my face. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think it was all covered. Um, someone asked if, uh, why it, it would want to be light, light, lighten the paper, sorry, like bleached, um, you know, just to make it more usable for printing. If it's too dark, you know, you can't really see the images or the text. Um, and then I, I am, I actually sent some fiber up to the university to do a new experiment because I have a friend in Colorado who he has um, processed the fibers in a different way. And actually I have some like right behind me, I can show you. <laughs> Right. Oh, that's cool. Um, so it's actually like real, it's like almost a powder. So what happened was with the other experiment, the fibers, the bass fibers were so, they're so strong. It's a blessing and a curse because 
it's hard to break into a pulp. So if you don't have the right machinery, it's gonna clog it up. And that's what happened, they clogged up. They were trying to use what's called a British refiner, which it was my fault because I should have gone there first to see what kind of refiner they use because it was totally different than what I had been using. Basically what they were using is, it's like a weed grinder. It was like these two discs that go like that, but it doesn't work for bass fiber. It works for short timber fibers. Um, but anyway, this stuff, I think would actually work. It, it might work in those types of refiners. So they actually, I just got an email from them this morning saying that uh, they received the fibers because I mailed them out last week. Um, so I should have some more results, um, some information soon about that. So yeah, going to try to keep going. I, uh, I spent all my money on that paper on that failed pilot run. So, but you know, it's like, we got to keep going. Like there's, <laughs> it, we just got to do it. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Winona. Appreciate it. Oh, well, somebody asked is... about bamboo. I mean, Very great. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say bam. I do know someone that has made bamboo uh, handmade paper it's also really hard to process. And like, maybe you remember like years ago, bamboo fabric became a really popular thing as it was touted as eco-friendly, but then it, you know, people found out like it was actually really toxic processing to soften the, the bamboo fibers. So I do, I think there's some toilet paper companies using bamboo. But I, I wonder about how clean it actually is, if it's actually, you know, um, uh, using a lot of toxic chemicals. Because, you know, you want to remember, like, all of that, all those toxins are going into the runoff, it's polluting the water. So the paper industry is one of the largest causes of water pollution on the planet. So I don't know, I, I, that's a good question. I would need to research more, but I think we need to be careful about greenwashing, you know, and people saying like bamboo is good because maybe it's, you know, they're just trying to sell product. Yeah, elephant poop. There's also a company, I think in India that's made paper from elephant poop. I mean, it's basically just fiber, it's cellulose. Um, and I think they use it for making flooring as well. Like there's a lot of cool uses for elephant poop. I haven't tried it yet. I don't know if I'll get there, but maybe, um, yeah, shipping. Yeah, for sure. Um, frozen meat. Yeah, I'm sure like any, it can be molded into any shape. And then some people are using mushroom, mushrooms to make molded products and um, shipping like uh, materials as well. Okay. That's a, yeah, that would be a good thing to look into. I, I know there's some companies that do, um, they send out produce, right? Like, or these meal kits now that are popular and they do these, uh, ice packs that I think they have some that are recyclable or paper-based. So that's a, that would be a good thing to look into. I, I haven't heard of anyone actually making them with paper or hemp paper. Yeah, I, um, currently I ship meat and the, the, um, supplier uses the dreaded material, you know, and I just hate that. And so I'm definitely looking for an alternative, but because the product has to stay frozen, it has to have that much insulation. And I thought, and hemp would be awesome to make instead of the other thing. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Oh, wait, is there a... Simpler method of making hemp paper. Um, yeah, I mean, the the length of time, I mean, it really depends. Uh, I like to break it down into two days. Like you have your cooking and pulping 
And then, I mean, it could all be done in one day, but cooking and pulping is about four hours, two hours each plus cleanup or prep and then making the sheets. Um, yeah, it, it just depends on how quickly you work and also the drainage time. But yeah, the simplest method is um, get some hemp stalks, grab a meat mallet, mash them down or, you know, cook them a little with some soda ash or wood ash, uh, mash them, you know, beat them down. And then I do have a video on YouTube that, that shows a method of a different method of making a sheet, um, which is called the pouring method. So if you have just like a little bit of pulp, cause that's what I did. I, I made, um, I made a special batch of paper with just the CBD stock fast fiber that I uh, steamed and then peeled it off. So yeah, if you look up um, artisan hemp on YouTube, I think it's it's on there. I, I show that method, but if you look up um, here, all right, uh, pouring method of sheet forming. That's another one that you don't have to have, and you don't have to have like a whole vat and everything. And actually, so if you don't have um, a mold and decal proper, it's really easy to make. You can go buy, find some old picture frames or, you know, uh, uh, put some together, nail a few pieces of wood together into a shape. Doesn't have to be square, any shape you want. Get some netting. I mean, I've used window netting, but sometimes the fibers stick to it too much. But um, there's some like, it's like a plastic uh, mesh that I've used that's sold at paper making supply store. I mean, the real good, the best molds you can get are actually made with uh, metal. They're like these intricately, um, woven metal screens but yeah like window screening um get a staple gun or some nails or some duct tape <laughs> put it on a old picture frame or something it's a really easy way to to make some molds and decals well thank you everybody um <laughs> We'll go back on mute now. Me. Well, thank you all for being here. And um, we're in week five. We're on week five of Hemp 101, New Green Revolution. And I just, um, I'm Lucille and I'm the IT person in the background. And I just wanted to tell you all that, um, you know, uh, if you're having any issues getting into um, the, the Moodle or getting into uh, uh, seeing the recordings of the videos, please send me an email at lucille at anishinaabeagriculture.com. Or I've also put my phone number in the Moodle and, and I don't mind if you give me a call and I can help uh, reconnect you if you need that. And so if you do get in the Moodle, I'm right now, actually, while we're in this class today, right now, I'm working on uh, uploading some more data that was sent to us from the hemp conference, but the recordings are there also. That would be week three, that was conference. And um, yeah, I'll just see if anybody else has any questions. If you all want anybody, just unmute. And...
Bonjour, Lucille. It's Danny. Danny, my relative. How are yes. you? I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. It's good to see you. Um, I have missed so many classes. Um, so on the Moodle, um, to find the the um the recording, you can hear my puppy in the background. He misses me. Um where where do I go to find the videos? You're muted, Lucille. Thank you. <laughs> um, once you click into the actual Moodle and you'll see the course syllabus, right below that, there's another link that says Tribal Hemp 101. Click that and that'll take you to the entire course contents. And um, I could share it and show y'all. classes do we have left? There are five classes left. And let's see, I think I'm going to get to it here. So. You'll see my back uh, administrator login. I have four screens here, so if you see me looking in a different direction, I'm I'm looking at that. Let's see. Can uh, y'all see? Are you seeing the screen that says Moodle Cloud? No, I'm not. Okay, let me pick that. I think there we go. All righty. Now, if you should be seeing the screen that says Moodle Cloud. Okay, so here we'll go in. And so when you first log in, if you've already um, created your account successfully, then you'll see green when you log in. If you're having trouble and you don't screen, go ahead and please send me an email. And then down here, is the Zoom link for the class. It's the same link every time. Then here's the actual course content, Tribal Hemp 101. And then it's divided by week. So we are on week five. Here again is the Zoom link. I try to put it in multiple locations. Also is this discussion board. So if anybody wants to continue, you know, talking offline, you would just come in here, click uh, add a topic. And then, you know, discuss like what was, for example, the name of that video. It was it um, that video that Ellie showed us paper and anyway, so this would be a, a place where we could actually continue talking about things after the course on your own time, you post it and then anybody could uh, reply to that. And if you click sub subscribe, which I have my on, you'll get a little ding that'll let you know. So then back again, here's, um, the main course contents divided by week. And each week has assigned materials and recording. And we are on, this is for the hemp conference. We are on week five. So we've got five more weeks um, and that's about it. So please let me know if anybody has any trouble accessing the materials. So once we finish this course, are there plans to have a another level or another um, option to, I mean, I know you're giving us the overview of everything, 
mm-hmm. as just an informational introduction, but will there be another level available that we could register for? Um, I will let uh, Miss Winona LaDuke answer that, but um, I, I do believe that there are more plans to continue with this. I mean, there's so much amazing uh, information out there and this is just another way for us to, you know, continuing building our sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I would say stay tuned. And I would hope for it to be virtual because I'm not down in your territory. I'm in Canada. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm mm-hmm. always, always requesting virtual access and glitch. Right, right. And yes, um, I'm also in Texas. I know everybody's in different locations. So that would be awesome. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, but we can still continue talking. I do have one addition. I hope everyone can hear me. about the, someone was asking about the discussion questions and kind of like the content check-in for the pass-fail element of the course. Um, One of the things that's coming out in the next couple of days, should hopefully be posted before Thursday, will be a kind of like week by week discussion question guide. Um, We haven't decided exactly how it'll be formatted, but there's a couple of longer questions and then a couple of just kind of like detailed questions Um, it's not going to be graded super rigorously, but it's more for your own exploration and cementing your knowledge about what we've kind of learned so far. Um, and I think it'll just be due, um, by the end of March. We haven't landed an exact date yet, but that was just to keep everyone in the loop there, that there are comprehension slash follow-up questions coming your way, um, and to look out for those by the end of the week and it will just be turned in on the Moodle platform.